Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Ryan White. I'm the director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization here at the Academy, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to the Schmidt Theater. Tonight's provocative conversation is Climate Change, Faith and Fact, featuring Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. The conversation will last about 35 minutes, and then you'll have a chance to chat further with our guests over dinner. At the end of the program, we are gonna ask that you exit at the top of the theater. If you have any difficulty with the stairs, don't worry, someone from the Academy will be able to assist you uh, through an exit down here at the bottom. Um, and then we also have plenty of extra helpers on hand to assist with any empty glasses and to escort you to dinner. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce a very special guest. Maya Bialik stars on the CBS hit comedy, The Big Bang Theory, a role that earned her a 2016 Critics' Choice Award and numerous Emmy nominations. Maya is also known um, by a generation a little younger than me uh, for her role as Blossom Russo on the 90s NBC <laughs> some of whom are in attendance, <laughs> of the NBC television sitcom Blossom. Uh, she went on to earn a degree in neuroscience from UCLA and received her PhD in 2007. So she's a real life scientist and she plays one on TV. Please help me in welcoming Maya. Is this thing on? Okay. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, it is really, it's wonderful to be here. This is, the Bay Area is sort of my home away from home. So it's really wonderful to be at the California Academy of Sciences and to celebrate with you and join you in what looks to be an incredible evening already. I will also be back here, <laughs> this is a little plug, I'll be back here at 9.30 um, to chat with Carrie Byron about science and Hollywood and other fun things and there will be um, an opportunity for you to learn other things about me if you'd like to. So um, plan to join us for the party after dark is what it's called, so that'll be right here at 9.30. I actually attended the, um, the March for Science this past weekend, yay, <laughs> yay science. Um, I attended the March for Science in Silicon Valley. Um, my my in-laws live there, so my my kids' grandparents are there, and um, it was really it was it was a pleasure to march. I actually um, spoke as well, and obviously a, a large emphasis of the signs and also what what a lot of the speakers spoke about um, was the climate change based work that people like Dr. Hayhoe um, are are doing. And I, I don't think I need to tell this audience why it's extremely important, but I think especially in the political climate that we're living in, um, it is increasingly important for us to have clarity um, about the issues, and I think that's why, why um, all of us are here. And I also would like to mention um, something that, um, that Dr. Hayho and I have in common is that um, we are both scientists and women of faith. And that's actually something that I spoke about when I spoke at the march, because um, it's really important for us to, to present all sorts of different um, perspectives on what it means to be a scientist, and in particular, what it means to be a woman in science. And there's a tremendous amount of interest for that um, as well, which I'm sure we will hear a bit on. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. We are delighted to have this outstanding thought leader in climate change with us tonight. And if there are any Lumineers fans, maybe her name Hayhoe makes you, okay, got it. Just a couple, sorry, I had to. Uh, <laughs> Catherine is an atmospheric scientist and associate professor of political science at Texas Tech University. She has been named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people and foreign policy's 100 leading global thinkers, which is incredibly impressive, as well as one of Politico's 50 thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics. She is currently serving as lead author for the upcoming fourth National Climate Assessment and producing a new PBS Digital Studios short series, Global Weirding, Climate, Politics, and Religion. Along with her husband, Pastor Andrew Farley, Hayhoe is the co-author of A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions. Please join me in welcoming tonight's esteemed speaker, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you for coming tonight. This is so fun. Usually I'm the one sitting up there watching a nature movie on the screen. I'm a climate scientist. And for those of us who follow climate change, and for those of us who understand 
that climate change is the greatest issue confronting us today because we will not be able to solve the world's problems if we leave climate change out of the picture. We will not be able to solve hunger. We will not be able to fix poverty. We will not be able to give people access to sufficient clean water or help them not die of diseases that nobody should die of in 2017. We can't do any of these things if we leave climate change out of the picture anymore because as the military says, climate change is a threat multiplier. For those of us who understand that climate change is exacerbating all of the risks we already face today, one of the biggest questions on our mind is, has half the United States and all of Washington lost their collective minds? <laughs> and that is the question that we will be talking about tonight. Because the answer is, no, they haven't. Their perspective is extremely rational from their point of view. And I've learned this firsthand because I live in Texas. I talk to my neighbors. I talk to people at church. I talk to my colleagues in the hallways. And what we are seeing today is a relatively rational response to what they perceive to be their values and the threats confronting us today. So where do we start? We're going to start by talking politics. Just a little bit, and it'll be bipartisan. We've got blue and red up here. In 1994, the Pew Foundation first started tracking political polarization in the United States. And when they first started tracking it, Democrats and Republicans were pretty close together, and their distributions were nice and symmetrical. That means most people are in the middle and least people are out at the ends. What happens as we step through time? Two things happen. Number one is the middle gets further apart, but number two is more people are moving out to the edges. And if you look at not just the general population, but you specifically look at people who are politically active, this is what it looks like. We are further apart today than any time in modern history. In fact, today, the number one predictor of who you will marry if you are not already married is not their appearance, not their level of education, not their cultural background or heritage. It is the simple fact of how close are they on the political spectrum to you. Is that crazy or what? What does this have to do with our opinions about climate change? Everything. Headline last year showed how unique the situation is here in the United States. It talked about how the Republican Party, a study found, stands alone in the world as the only major political party that says that the science isn't real on climate change. And surveys bear this out. A survey conducted in November, last November, showed that when you ask people, do you think climate is changing and do you think humans are responsible, a question that well over 97% of scientists agree on, the differences are stark. And this is a work by a colleague of mine called Larry Hamilton in New Hampshire. When you ask people specific questions like, do you think Arctic sea ice is going down? Guess what? The answer is completely different depending on who you voted for. Now you might say, well, why is it different? It's probably because of where we get our information from. And Larry went down this path, first of all noting that, yes, Arctic sea ice is going down, if anybody was wondering, very quickly. In fact, it's in what they ca they're calling a death spiral these days. But Larry looked at where people get their information from. And he found, <laughs> yeah. He found that depending on who you voted for, you got your information from quite different sources. And why does it matter where you get your information from? Because a couple of years ago, the Union of Concerned Scientists did a study looking at the accuracy of reporting on climate change on cable news. And when they did that, this was the pie chart for Fox News. 
So you might say, well, people just think that the Arctic ice isn't going down because they're getting false information from the media they listen to. And that's part of it. But Larry went one step further. He said, all right, in New Hampshire this past January, we had a record warm January in New Hampshire. Will people believe the evidence of their eyes and the thermometers in their own backyard? Turns out, uh, no, they won't. Do you think last January was unusually warm, he asked people, and it turns out whether you thought it was warm or not depended on how you voted. But a thermometer isn't Democrat or Republican. It doesn't give you a different answer depending on how you vote. If you look at thermometers and you look at the winter in New Hampshire, I don't know if you can see that little circle up there, that was the winter he was talking about. It was very warm. That's a picture of the inside of my head. <laughs> so let's look at possible reasons. Why is it that we will deny the evidence of our own eyes? There's a famous quote that says that it's hard to get a man to believe something that his salary depends on him not believing. And so is this just an economic argument? There's certainly evidence that economics comes into it. This is a quote from Senator Inhofe, who is well known for writing a book about how climate change is a hoax, the greatest hoax ever perpetuated. But this is what he said five years ago when he was being interviewed by Rachel Maddow. He said, do you realize I was actually on your side of this issue when I first heard about it? I was on your side until when? Until I opened the Bible? Nope. Until I read an alternative news site? Nope. I was on your side until I found out how much it would cost. So I like to show you pictures of scientists. You know what these real people look like. This is Sandra. He said, is it economics that accounts for political opinions about climate change? And he said, when you look at what countries in the world have fossil fuel resources, coal, gas, and oil, it's true that it does seem to have an influence on conservative politics. And if you look in the United States specifically, and you look at big donors to politics, there are some very big donors, and most of those donors have connections to the fossil fuel industry. But who are they giving money to? Try to guess who are the top one, two, three candidates in the last election in the primaries, as well as the main election that they gave the most money to, okay? Get your, get your list in your head, one, two, and three. Here's one, two, and three. Now be honest, did anybody get this right? The fossil fuel sweepstakes. Not a lot of hands going up. And that's what he went on to conclude. He went on to conclude, no, in the United States, that is not all that's going on. There is more going on. Purely economic reasons do not explain it. So then we might say, is it lack of knowledge or understanding? Because when we listen to what people are saying, they're saying some things that suggest they don't know what the heck is going on. This quote, for example, the debate is far from settled. Well, we've known since 1850s that burning coal and gas and oil produces carbon dioxide. We've known since the 1890s how much the world would warm if we doubled or tripled levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the first study that actually detected the human influence on global temperature was published in 1938. By 50 years ago, scientists were convinced enough of the seriousness of this issue to formally warn a president, and the president who was formally warned about the dangers of climate change was Lyndon B. Johnson. So you might say, maybe they just need more information, because some of them seem to think that for everybody who thinks it's warming, I can find an equal expert who says it's not. And why do we think that? Because we turn on the television, and what do we see? We see one head saying it's real and another saying it's not. And I'm not talking about Fox News. This past week, I'm talking about CBS News. I'm talking about CNN. And then we have people saying, oh, well, those scientists are just in it for the money. They're throwing the science out the door. They're just doing this because they have an agenda. So the number one question that I get, and this is the topic of one of our global weirding videos, the number one question I get is, if you could just talk to 
insert name, and explain the science, I'm sure they'd get it. This idea is built on a concept called information deficit. The idea that we're blank slates, we don't know enough, we're waiting to get the right information, and when we get it, we'll change our minds. I am a physical scientist, but over the last few years, I have learned the most, not from physical science, but from social sciences that study how we as humans interact with information. And so this is Dan, Dan Cahan, and he's a social scientist who decided to study this. He said, it's true that when you hear people talking about this issue, you think they don't know what they're talking about. People know too little science to understand the evidence. And if that is the case, then what should scientists be doing about it? If people don't know enough science, we should write another report. Because these were the original IPCC reports written in 1990. They're kind of out of date. So they wrote a new set in 94, and then they wrote another set in 2000. Another set in 2005, 2010, and the most recent set. But maybe those were international. Maybe we need a national climate assessment, or another, or a third, or the fourth one, which we're writing right now, with color graphics, even some animations. Well, but those were government reports. How about a National Academy of Sciences report, or another, or another? You get the point here. What I love about social science is they tested this. We conducted a study, says Dan, to test this, and we found no support. In fact, he said, get this, people who knew the most about science were the most polarized about this issue. Is that crazy or what? And Larry's results go on to say this. So here we have what you think about climate change. Is it caused by human activities? And on the bottom, you have our level of education. So over here, you have people who have completed some high school, and over here, you have people who have done some postgraduate studies. What is happening? The gap is getting wider the more you know. It's crazy. But that's why facts are not enough, and that's not what's going to fix this problem. So then we get to a big one. Is it religion? Because, according to Ted Cruz, climate change is not science, it is a religion. It is one where you worship the earth and you prioritize it over everything else, including people. This is a really interesting one because over 74% of people in the United States are Christian, specifically, and over 85% of people in the United States belong to a specific religious tradition. And so casting climate change as an alternate religion is a very clever way to get people to reject it. Because if you are already happy with your beliefs, and most people are, you don't want a new religion coming along. And so that's why we hear people, and this is somebody from California, emphasizing the role of faith when they are dismissing climate change because they are the true believer and they are rejecting the false prophet who worships Gaia, Al Gore High Priest, Catherine Hayhoe, priestess. <laughs> the climate of the globe has been fluctuating since God created it. Or, as Inhofe said, God is still up there and the arrogance of people to think we could change what he is doing to the climate is outrageous. I hear this one all the time. And it's amazing because I hear it from people who I know have been in an airplane and have looked down on the earth and have seen with their own eyeballs the incredible impact that humans are having on this planet now that we have seven and a half billion people. The cognitive dissonance is stunning. And again, that's why facts are not enough. If it's just a case of thinking it's, an, <laughs> it's a religion, let's just get the Pope to set them straight, right? Because we all know what the Pope says. He says a lot of good things. This is just one tiny little quote from the massive encyclical he published a year and a half ago. Global warming is being caused by enormous consumption of wealthy nations with repercussions on the poorest places of the planet. And good news, there was a measurable Pope effect in the United States after the encyclical came out. 
but it was measured in single digits. And ironically, it was actually larger among Protestants than Catholics. And you might say, well, that's good, because aren't those white evangelicals absolutely the worst when it comes to climate change? Uh, actually, no, we're second worst. If you look at evangelicals, and this has been done before. They have put evangelical pastors on a boat and taken them up to the Arctic to look at melting ice. And then they come home convinced, and then they realize that if you talk about it, you're going to get shot in the head, metaphorically. When you ask people what they think about a changing climate and how worried you are about it, and then you divide their answers out by religious affiliation. So at the top, we have all Americans, and then you have unaffiliated two down. But I want to draw your attention here. Who is the most concerned people group in the entire United States about a changing climate? Hispanic Catholics. OK, they got the pope, right? Who's the least concerned group? White Catholics. Beat out evangelicals by a hair. This is how we know it isn't actually religion, because don't they go to the same church? Don't we, you know, doesn't every Catholic have the same pope? You like to think so. What is going on here? So another sociologist to the rescue, this is John Evans. He says, we know that compared to people who aren't actively religious, conservative Protestants are much more likely to reject the science of climate change. And I know this firsthand because being a scientist, I run a little experiment on my Facebook page. I get, you know, anywhere between three to ten really nasty comments a week. I get them via email and snail mail even sometimes too, some on Twitter. And so when I get those, I click on their profiles because I want to see who these people are. So these are just my informal stats. But informally, about half of the people who leave me nasty comments are people who self-identify in their social media profiles as Christians and as conservatives. And that's what John went on to find. He said, when you control for demographics, it's not where you go to church that matters. What matters is age and where you are on the political spectrum. The older people are, the more conservative they are, the more likely they are to say this isn't real. So when you hear people say, I don't believe in global warming, it's a smoke screen. We hear sciencey sounding arguments all the time. It's just a natural cycle. We hear religiously sounding arguments all the time. God's in control. Humans could never affect the planet. But when we go to the science and when we go to the Bible and other religious texts, neither of them support the sciencey or the religiously arguments we're hearing because they're smoke screens. What are they smoke screens for? They're smoke screens for a political ideology that is unique to the United States. And it is best expressed by one of my colleagues from the National Association of Evangelicals. This is Galen Carey, and he said something which I think is right on. He said, many evangelicals oppose actions to slow climate, but it's not on a religious basis. It's politically because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. Two years ago, I was speaking to a group of water managers down in South Texas, as I often do. And it was a bunch of you know, older folks. Um, most people you could kind of tell were sort of uncertain. Nobody wanted to sit in the front row. They all kind of looked at the woman who invited me like, are you sure about this? But I've lived in Texas for a while, and I know how to talk water. So we talked water. We talked historical trends. We talked water conservation and future projections. And at the end, an older man at the very back stood up and put up his hand. I said, yes. He said, you know, when I first came in, I wasn't too sure about this whole thing, but it all makes sense to me now. I just have one problem, and that is I don't want the government setting my thermostat. That encapsulates in one sentence the primary objection to this. Because, as somebody who's the polar opposite of Galen would say, Jonathan Chait, the virulence of anti-government ideology in the United States has no parallel anywhere in the world. 
How does this connect to climate change? Climate change is a tragedy of the commons. That phrase comes from back in England when villages had a common grazing area. But if you graze too many of your own animals and everybody else grazed too many of their animals, they'd eat up all the grass and everyone would suffer. The atmosphere today is our global commons, as is the ocean. And because it's a tragedy of the commons, it requires collective action. And because it requires collective action, government policy is best suited to address it. What does government policy involve? Giving the government more power than it has today. And half the country would rather cut off their right arm almost than give the government any more power. That is the root of the rejection of climate science. So when we have a conversation about climate change, and scientist Susie shows up with all her scientific reports, what does Calvin respond with? Calvin does not respond with a similar pile of scientific reports or data or facts or figures. Calvin responds with his identity. Or, we recently had the March for Science, we showed up with these amazing signs. And we were just talking earlier about, I love the signs. They were just nerd heaven. <laughs> I was hard pressed to find the perfect sign because they're all great. Imagine somebody holding this sign having a conversation with this guy. You get the point, right? The conversation will usually end something like this. So, last question. Is there any way to actually have a civil conversation about this? And the answer to this is yes, with an asterisk. What do I mean by that? This is not a yes or no issue. Either you believe in climate change or you deny climate change. First of all, when people ask me if I believe, my answer is no. I actually don't believe in climate change. Why? Because belief is the evidence of what we don't see. It's based on spiritual apprehension, not proof. Science is the evidence of what we see with our own eyes. By definition, science has to be testable. I don't believe in climate change. I know that climate is changing and humans are responsible and the impacts are serious because of all the mountain of evidence we've assembled over the past 150 years. So it isn't monolithic, and that's why I love this study from Yale called the Six Americas of Global Warming. I love it because they have showed how there's a spectrum of what we think about climate change. People are alarmed, and then there's a bigger group that's concerned, and then the biggest group is actually, guess what? Cautious. The biggest group of people, including many of my own neighbors, are cautious. Then you have people who are disengaged and doubtful, and then at the very end you have dismissives. Now, dismissives seem out of proportionally large because they populate the comment feed of any online article. <laughs> they populate the blogs of any conservative news site, and they populate half of the screen on many of our major networks. So we often think, the dismissives are more than they are. And so often, when someone comes to me and says, could you please talk to so-and-so, they're often asking me to talk to somebody who is dismissive. Because dismissives talk about climate change much more than people who are doubtful, or cautious, or disengaged. So a couple of years ago, I was part of the Years of Living Dangerously. If you haven't seen it, you have to check it out. It won best documentary at the Emmys. It actually beat out Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos. We couldn't believe it. I'm a little biased there, although I love Cosmos too. And so in one of the episodes, one of them we went to Texas, another episode, my friend Anna Jane Joyner, who you can see right there, asked me to come to meet her dad, Rick. Rick is a mega church pastor, very conservative, very convinced that climate change isn't real. Rick is dismissive. So knowing the social science, I knew, or at least I had an educated guess at what was going to happen. When you argue the facts with somebody who's dismissive, the end result is they dig in even deeper. 
they harden their beliefs. They go out looking for more information that will confirm their bias. And I'm sorry to say that is exactly what happened. In fact, Anna Jane just shared with me that later, after I spent some time talking with her dad, later they brought in a much older male scientist who was an atheist, and her dad listened to him more than he listened to me. But Anna also shared with me that recently, and this was a couple of years ago that they had this, this, this episode, recently she and her dad got talking, and they actually got down to the deep level, where they could talk not about facts and figures and information in politics, but they started talking about their fears. And you know what she found out? She found out that actually their fears weren't that different. It's just that how they acted on them was just completely different. So I don't really do a lot of talking to people who are dismissive because as I think about it, an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone saying global warming is real in flaming letters would not be enough to change their minds. So who do I think I am? <laughs> but the good news is, is they're actually a very small proportion of the population. And when you ask people across the United States, and these are more maps from the Yale group, you ask people across the whole United States, do you think climate is changing due to human activities? This is not a very happy map. In fact, this is quite grim. Why? Because anything that is blue is below 50%. If you're curious, you can find these online. Just Google Yale Climate Opinion. And it breaks out the results by state, by county, and by congressional district. Very interesting. So you look at this and you say, well, clearly people have to realize that climate is changing and humans are responsible. But they went on and they asked some more questions. Do you think that global warming will harm people in developing countries? Guess what? They do. More than 70% of people agree that it would. Do you think that we should require utilities to produce at least 20% of their electricity from renewable sources? Yes. Do you support, get this, do you support strict CO2 limits on power plants? Does that sound familiar, the clean power plan? Guess what? Yes, everybody did support it. And here's the kicker. Do you support funding research into renewable energy? Yes, everybody does. So how can we talk about these polarized issues? I think we can have conversations with 90% of people that end well. You can still have a conversation with the 10%, but I cannot promise that it will end well. Number one, start by actually talking with, getting to know whoever it is, family member, colleague, person you're talking to, audience, getting to know what makes them tick. What are their fears? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their loves and their hates? And what is something that you genuinely share with them? Then connect that to climate change. Not working from the head, working from the heart. At that point, if we have to do any explaining at all, this is where it goes. But step three is really optional because the most important thing is to talk solutions. Because when we feel like we can't fix a problem, you know what our human psychological defense is to that? Imagine a huge problem that you can't fix. You dissociate, you disengage, you deny. If you feel like the only solution to climate change is big government and you'd rather cut off your arm than have big government, there's nothing to do about it. But that's why it's so important to say there are many things you can do about it. Let me give you just a couple of examples here. What values do we share with people? Do we fish? That is me. I used to fish four hours a day. And I would do catch and release. In fact, I think it was actually a source of lunch for many of those bass. Because by the end of the four hours, a few of them would have a bunch of holes and a lot of worms. Do we ski? Also me. Are we parents? Do we belong to the Rotary Club? A couple of years ago, I was invited to speak to the Rotary Club. On the way in, I noticed this banner. I thought, oh my goodness, this is climate change. Is it fair? No. Is it the truth? Yes. Would it be beneficial to do something about it? Absolutely. So I skipped the lunch, I rearranged my presentation, I put in these headings, and at the end, an older businessman came up to me and he said, you know, I'm just not on board with this whole global warming thing, but 
it meets the four-way test. <laughs> Did you know that almost every single major world religion and faith tradition has in its writings the idea of stewardship or caring for creation and caring for people who are poor and vulnerable? And then there's just the sense of place. This is where I live. Yes, literally, this is what my backyard looks like. That's cotton. Nearly everybody on the planet has all the values they need. We don't have to instill new values in people. We just have to connect the dots. And that is a lot different, isn't it? So then we connect. Given our shared values, how do we connect? Shared love of skiing. Well, guess what? The ski season is becoming increasingly imperiled. Did you know that the birds we grew up birding are moving to different places? The Baltimore Oriole will not even be native to Baltimore anymore as climate changes. Did you know that the solutions are amazing? Chicago is putting green roofs downtown to save energy and lower the urban heat island effect and give you an awesome place to eat lunch. Dallas is doing some stuff too. And of course, we all care about water, especially here in California, as well as in Texas. We can easily connect issues of climate to issues we care about. And then, from a humanitarian perspective, it's even easier because this is a map of who will be most affected by a changing climate. Remember I started off by talking about hunger and poverty? Civil and political unrest? Lack of access to clean water? Climate change is multiplying the threats in these places. And as the, as the Texas translation of the Bible says, that translation is printed on road signs, that love your neighbor thing, I really meant it. At that point, we could do some explaining if we need to. It's real, it's us, scientists agree. Why does it matter if we live in the east where sea level is rising and hurricanes are getting stronger? Why does it matter if we live in the west where beetles are overwintering eating millions of acres of trees, increasing the risk of very big wildfires? Why does it matter up in the Arctic where what used to be permanently frozen ground is thawing and crumbling and falling under people's feet? Why does it matter in the global south where increasing risk of heavy precipitation is increasing flood risk washing away people's homes? But lastly, we have to end with solutions. How can we work together to fix this in positive ways that are compatible with our values? And that's why I comb the newspapers to find these examples because they are great conversation starters. Imagine talking to Uncle Joe and going up there and saying, well, Uncle Joe, you know, global temperatures are the warmest on record and scientists say, versus going up to Uncle Joe and saying, Uncle Joe, did you know, let me go back to this for a second here, did you know that in the Netherlands they're building floating villages, so as sea level rises you just get a few more feet of anchor chain? Or Uncle Joe, did you know that in Africa they've got pay-as-you-go solar systems for people who don't have energy? Or Uncle Joe, did you know that in Texas they're getting almost a quarter of their energy from wind now? And they've got 30,000 jobs too. You know what? One of the biggest things we can do about climate change is talk about it. Because this is the last Yale map and they said, how often do you talk about climate change? Cast your eyes over to San Francisco. Not very much. In fact, 75% of people in the United States hear somebody else talking about climate change less than once or twice a year. Isn't that crazy? What can we talk about? We can talk about how this is a real problem affecting us here in the United States as well as on the opposite side of the world. We can talk about how people are preparing for a changing climate, whether it's farmers in Texas putting in drip irrigation that saves huge amounts of water or building floating villages in the Netherlands. We can talk about how things are changing and China is spending $360 billion on a clean energy economy for, to create 13 million jobs. The cheapest solar prices today are in Mexico, Peru, and India. Unsubsidized. Not here. In Texas, I talk about how Fort Hood, the biggest military base in the US, signed a new contract for wind and solar to save taxpayers $165 million. Or how wind energy in Texas is breaking records, or how small towns in Texas are actually going 100% green, like Georgetown. I talk about what's going on in California, too. Huge solar farms opening. 
California shattering solar records. These are great conversation starters. We can talk about this. We can talk about it. We can go somewhere good with it, too. And lastly, we can make our voices heard. Did you know that there's a bipartisan, bipartisan climate solutions caucus with 38 members, half of them are Republican? They're adding more every month. Why only 38? Because you can't join if you're a Democrat unless you have a partner, which is pretty cool. So how do we talk about climate? By bonding over our shared values, by connecting them to climate. If we have to do any explaining at all, that's where we talk about explaining. But most of all, finding ways we can work together. To close with the words of my favorite scientist, Jane Goodall, it's only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential. Thank you. <laughs>